Our best athletes are in jail and we've got to get them out. We've got to be creating more opportunities. That's, well, I've been doing it, but I'm going to be bloody doing it a lot more. John Quinn, a widely respected leader in the elite coaching field with experience across a diverse range of sports. Also an inspirational figure. After fighting his tragic past. The chances of surviving encephalitis are less than 10%. They can't stop the inflammation on your brain. It's almost like if you could imagine having lightning strikes going your brain. And I've lost at least seven years of memory, like it never Ever happened so when I think back I woke up in the house one day and then I heard my son and so I got up and I called him and he walked out of the room and I wanted to get back to Sydney I don't remember coming back to Sydney but my objective was to get back to my kids I needed to be there to be their dad that's the loneliest I've ever been in my existence and I had to if you're interested in growing well through townhouse development, check out the Little Fish Network. You get coaching, expert access, and community support. It's essentially everything you need to win a property and development. Let's get into it. Welcome back to Australia's number one podcast. We are the Little Fish, and we speak to the big fish about town each and every week. This year, guys, as you know, for every subscribe, follow, or review in 2024, we're donating $1 to our amazing charity, Epidemolus bullosa, EB, the worst disease you've never heard of. And of course, if you want to donate directly, littlefishpodcast.com.au. The big pink donate button. Big pink button. Benny's made that very obvious there for you, <laughs> so you don't miss it. Um, but yeah great, yeah, great cause, guys, and we're getting behind it. We're going to get a cure, so get behind us. John, thanks for coming on. Oh, it's a pleasure. Great to be with you. You've uh, you made a bit of effort today. There was a bit of a mix-up on our end, but you've... Uh, <laughs> You've made a big effort to get across here, mate. Huge sacrifice to come to Maroubra. <laughs> it's terrible. No, no problem at all. It's very nice. We were running earlier. A bit of high performance. Brucey was... Uh, Leading the pack. Took, was, us, took us on a run. Yeah, it was good. Brought the energy, didn't we? Yeah, that was good. I actually feel really good after that. Yeah, man. that's it. A little afternoon yeah. movement. Yeah. 100%. John, we were talking earlier, and there's a lot There's a lot to, there's a lot to your career, you know, spanning over decades and decades. Um, so there's a lot of places we could go, but I'd love to start where it started for you. You said the core to your career is athletics. How did I, f I find it interesting where it where it all began? Yeah, well, I grew up in a country town uh, about three hours from Sydney, a town called Yass, and uh, went to school in Canberra. And the only sport you played in town when I was there, uh, rugby league. So I played rugby league from about the age of six to the age of twenty. Yep. And uh, that included a bit of rep football for well, what's now the Canberra Raiders with, uh, you know, some good guys. I wasn't really that good at rugby league. I was just fast. <laughs> and uh, I, um, from coaching, uh, from being involved in rugby league, I started coaching junior kids in town. And I said to one of the boys one day, you know, you're pretty fast. You should get uh, some coaching for running. And he says, oh, that'd be good. And his mum was there and she said, oh, when do you want me to bring him in? So that's when I became an athletics coach. I was about 17 and we didn't have an athletics club in Yass and the idea of going to Canberra to do athletics training, well, that wasn't mm -hmm. on. So there was another fellow in town. He was uh, new to town. He was the local butcher, Donnie Parks. And uh, together we set up the Yass Athletics Club, which is still going today. And we've had athletes or that club has had athletes go off to international meets uh, to represent. So it um, has spawned a lot of talent that that little town and uh, I've been involved in athletics ever since so uh, I'm uh, 59 so it's a long way from 17 to 59 and yeah. uh, athletics underpins everything that I've done since so I'm probably one of those people I'm blessed actually in life I've never really worked a day in my life yeah that's uh, I've only ever really done I've done uh, coaching running around outside telling people how to put one step in one <laughs> foot in front of the other a bit quicker and they actually pay me for that and uh, no, I've had a blessed life and uh, it all goes back to Yes and the athletics club that we founded there all those years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And when you say you've never worked a day in your life, you sort of look like you actually genuinely enjoy it when you talk about it. And um, so I sort of, yeah, really believe you. Oh, no, I do, I do think that. I, I coach my athletes on a, um, I look at it, as, it's very easy to get someone fit. If someone wants to get fit, that's mm. easy. So that's the physical part. So the physical part of, of uh, training is the easy, easy thing. As a person gets 
better physically, they become more confident and they become more motivated. So they start looking for better ways to do it or more challenging sessions to do. So then they become fitter, which then fuels that again. If that's it, then that's still a fairly flat plateau, I think. Mm. So then you've got to get into the person themselves and bring out the best in that person, which allows them then to become mentally more confident and then they become physically stronger again. So it takes them to a new level. So I call it the triad. It's mental, physical, spiritual. And some people find that, well, what is it, getting a bit religious and heavy on me, but mm-hmm. if I'm standing at the um, race in a game of football and the players have had an ordinary first half and I look at them and say, give me a bit of spirit, you guys. What's wrong with you? You're not playing anything like what we've trained. Show me a bit of spirit. Show me something. I'm not asking them to fall on their knees and bless themselves. I'm asking Mm. them to show them what's inside you. Express yourself the way you play. Take the game on. Play with courage. Play with conviction. Play with belief. Once you've got spirituality underlying your physical and mental prep, nothing can stop you. Yeah, that's crazy. I've never really sort of heard it broken down like that. I guess for the you know the average person, it's it's a real physical, um, you know, it's a physical challenge. Well, look, as a coach, it's really important to understand that you coach people. They might do sprinting. Mm. They might be a footballer. They might be a hockey player. They might be a tennis player. They're people. They're that. That's what defines them, not what they do. It's who they are. And what they do just enhances the person. So that's my job as a coach, to bring out the, the inner person so they can express themselves at the highest level. That's a high-performance coach. Mm. Yeah. All, how do you all like facets to, of it. Sorry to get you off. No, how, no. How, how do you tap into a specific per- person or a specific team to, to bring that out of them when they're, they're not performing? Oh, not everybody wants to be tapped into, <laughs> use your, <laughs> your words. Um, it's up to them. And you make that connection. And you make the connection on uh, shared experiences and genuine empathy. Um, many years ago, I did my first coaching course and took them quite literally when they talked about it's so important to be athlete first and winning second. And unfortunately, when you get into high-performance sport, there's a lot of people there seeking reflected glory so if the athlete does well then that must mean i'm a good coach or i'm a good person or i'm really something special when at the end of the day you've got a talented athlete and maybe they're being good in spite of what you're doing not because of what you're doing but you have to connect with that athlete and you can't connect with all of them Uh, and that's what makes the coach athlete relationship such a special thing because when that you get that connection right everything else flows from that and that's where the true performance has come out. Can I, can I just go, can we just go back to the triad for a second? You mentioned, um, you mentioned the mental and physical, which I think we all, we all understand. I think, you know, we've always known that the physicals there and mental in, you know, recent decades has been spoken about, but you mentioned the spiritual. Can you sort of unpack that a little bit for us and explain what you mean by help them find that, that underpinning spirituality? what that means yes I think you've got to uh, encourage them to talk about uh, who they are look if you want to know the athlete go to where they're from go to meet their family see where they grew up see the challenges that they've had as a young kid coming through because they're the challenges that have molded that person that's now in front of you and there are instances there that may be limiting their performance and their ability to go forward Give them the support that they need to take those challenges on, even if that risks what they perceive as failure. But by attacking that, then they're going to become a stronger person anyway. So there is no failure. You're only going to become a better person by taking that on. But that confidence that grows again, I think that underpins your sense of self-belief, your sense of conviction, and your ability to take on bigger challenges and tasks. So again, that spirituality, the inner person, the thing that defines that person, ultimately is responsible for allowing the best performances to come out. Do you, do you find there's any sort of correlation with, because, you know, like we said, we've worked with some of the uh, the highest performing sporting teams, you know, in, in, in Australia. Do you think there's any correlation between, go back again to spirituality, to the most elite or successful athletes that, 
that are connected to spirituality as far as religion. Is there, do, do you see any, does that sort of make sense? Yes, I think so. I I've, I've have coached athletes that are deeply religious. Uh, and I, one that springs to mind was a, a Muslim athlete that had come to uh, Australia to live from Algeria. And they were very deeply religious and they would put that before but quite often I think you've got to be careful that you're not using religion as a as a crutch and if God wills it then this is what I'm going to be and uh, I have used the story with an athlete in the past who used uh, the whole essence of God and belief as if God wills it this is what I will be in uh, Arabic they say inshallah which is oh, if course. God wills it uh -huh. and uh, I would say to them I tell them the story of a man who uh, fell off a boat in, an, in huge seas and he was out at sea and he was praying to God to save him and a helicopter spotted him and put a spotlight and dropped a ladder down and he said, no, I'm praying to God, God will save me. So they pulled the ladder up and flew off and then a big shipping liner come past and they said, come on. And he said, no, I'm waiting for God to save me and on they went and it goes on. And in the end, he drowns and he finds himself in front of God and he's really angry with God because he had such a life to lead. And he said, why didn't you save me? I was praying to you to save me. And God said, what more did you want? I sent a <laughs> helicopter, I sent a ship. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it's yeah. in your hands yeah, to yeah. Re represent and present as you, as you like. But I think uh, uh, you need to tap in to the individual person. If that has a religious context to it then utilize that and respect that but it doesn't have to be religious we're talking about the thing that defines a person right. and i go to great lengths to say we're talking about a person's self-expression their spirituality it does not have to be a religious context it's about what makes that person a unique individual and tapping into that their fears, insecurities, their beliefs, their hopes, their desires, their wishes, their dreams. The things that they protect probably the most, like that's what you've got to try and yes. peel back, right? Yes. Because even the people that you're working with, some of those would be in the subconscious as well, not necessarily a conscious thing of their own. Like you need to dig it out. Is that, was, yes. is that making sense? And sometimes I think you find people that even use those fears and those self-limiting beliefs that's the reason why they don't actually succeed. They've always got that little, there's a reason why. There's I a limiting belief. This. Yeah, there's Limit. always a reason. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to go after that. You've got to be able to recognise that and work with them as a coach. Look, coaching's really easy. You just tell someone to put that foot in front of that one faster and you're going to run quicker. But there's a hell of a lot more to it than that because you've got to build the person physically, mentally and their own self-belief. Especially in athletics, right? When, yeah. they, when they won for the Olympic Games four years on the line you're running 100 400 whatever it is you know what i mean like yeah. to be ready for that I, moment dude how sort of agree. how do you I, get I ready agree for with that, that and i don't agree with yeah. that really um at least one of the things i love about athletics you've either done it or you haven't done it you either run the time or you haven't it's not someone saying well i thought you were the best on ground son mm -hmm. you yeah. were fantastic if that umpire hadn't have stopped that i mean they've got all these other all oh, the conditions mm. all the the ball was slippery. Oh, if you hadn't have been taken out, all those other things. To me, that's crap. It's you've still got to come down to your ability to assess your own performance. I love the purity of it, of track and field, where you've either done it or you haven't. haven't. Yeah, yeah. So, John, you've you know, at seventeen, you know, you started coaching. Mm. Obviously, with probably not too much training or degrees behind you at that no, point. I, I thought I knew everything. <laughs> you know? So that counted for something, I suppose. Yeah. Look, I. I did that and I, I actually uh, had decided when I left school that I didn't want to just go to university. I, I had a, um, actually it was an old nun at the um, uh, Catholic school where I went to as a kid and she was talking to me one day and she said, you know, uh, what do you want to be? And I said, oh, I'm thinking about being a teacher. And she said, well, how would you do that? And I said, well, I'll go to teacher's college or uni and then come out and teach. She said, well, that's not a teacher. That's just someone telling other people what to do. I said, well, what's a teacher? She said, go and live your life first. Go and live your life. And if you uh, go and learn and you still want to be a teacher, then come and do it. Then you can teach kids reading, writing, arithmetic, but you can also teach them life. Mm -hmm. And I look back on that now, 
that was a 90 year old music teacher I had and she was my first mentor and I, I remember it to this day and it was the best advice I ever had and I took it quite literally and I spent the first couple of years well I got a job at the hospital in Yass doing administrative work but um, I was probably past the statute of limitations now and I can say I spent most of my time actually uh, setting up the Yass Athletics Club oh. and doing newsletters <laughs> and, and getting the membership balance uh, sorted out. Um, it was a great, great opportunity for me to learn basic admin work and I enjoyed it there. But um, our club at Yass grew to such an extent. Uh, within two years, we were uh, one of the biggest clubs in New South Wales, including Sydney. We had uh, over 90 registered members after about 18 months and we were very active. We'd take busloads of kids off to Albury and Wagga for competition and so on. And it caught the eye of Little Athletics in New South Wales. And so I got approached to move to Sydney to be an uh, education and develop, development officer for Little Athletics in New South Wales. So I packed up and moved to the Big Smoke and moved to Sydney as a 20 year old and I'd do about 140,000 kilometres a year driving from Bondi to Broken Hill and every town in between. There's very few places in New South Wales that I seriously have not been to and uh, one of the greatest memories I have of that was doing School of the Air and this was in the days when uh, it was literally School of the Air and we had radios and you used to have to uh, use a, a, like a, a two-way radio and uh, say uh, this is John from Little Athletics, uh, can you all hear me? Over. And then all these kids would be talking from all far-flung places. And they were flying them in to do um, athletic clinics and things into this remote cattle station. So from that to uh, spending some time living with Indigenous settlements and so on, through to some of the most exclusive schools in Australia, it was a great life grounding for a 20-year-old and to understand the importance of athletics. And, you know, we almost did it with this, um, you know, it was like selling athletics and a healthy living to kids all over the, the state. And uh, that, that uh, had a lot to do with my development as a coach as well. I loved doing it. And I did that for, well, for six years, but halfway through that I realised I needed to get qualified here. Mm -hmm. And a course came up at the Uni of New South Wales and it was in... Um, coaching and exercise physiology so I didn't even know what exercise physiology was but it sounded impressive so I did that course to become a better coach and by the time I'd finished um, well I'd been offered a job at the Australian Institute of Sport before I'd finished and that seemed pretty cool because I could go back to where I was from I went to school in Canberra so to go back to the AOS sounded pretty good and I just said look I've only got about 10 weeks of this semester to go and uh, the boss of the, uh, the track program at that time was a guy called Peter Bowman. And Peter said, oh, no, that's all right. We'll hold the job for you, son. You'll be right. So when the time came, I rang him and said, oh, you know, I'm all ready to go. And he said, look, I've got some good news and bad. And I said, oh, yeah, um, what's the good news? He said, well, the good news is you've got a job with the AIS. I said, and the bad? He said, well, we're decentralising the AIS. Now, you've got a choice, though. You can either go to Townsville and run a program there through the Queensland Academy of Sport or you can go to Hobart and set up an AIS program uh, through the Tasmanian Institute of Sport. You got, you got well, two extremes there, John. Well, I, I, I knew everything then. I was 26 <laughs> and uh, I chose Hobart because I could run my own program. So little did I know the sliding door moment that that would be, but I moved to Tasmania and absolutely loved being in Tasmania and uh, soon realised that Tasmania is a unique state in many ways. Um, it's got its... People know about the divide of the north versus the south. You've got to remember Hobart was founded about the same time as Sydney and uh, it was a convict settlement and it had soldiers and the like. Up north in Launceston, uh, free settlers. So the free settlers looked down at the, um, the convicts and the soldiers mm. down south. That divide line is at a place called Oatlands Junction. It's still there to this day. So you've got the north part of the state, the southern part of the state, and then over in the northwest you've got uh, Devonport and Burnie, and they are law under themselves over there. So <laughs> I always think Tassie's a bit like another country with three states within. Yeah. Um, and my job there was to unite Tasmania against the, the tyranny of Australia. So <laughs> it was a us against them mentality. But it was, in all seriousness, it was a great opportunity for me 
and uh, I worked down there uh, for several years and I'd spend a lot of time travelling with teams and we'd be in Europe and we'd go and base ourselves in places like Belgium and whatever and that's great for a time to go and look around the shopping centres and things but I soon got bored from that and uh, I'd go off looking and trying to find new ways of training and I found myself in hospitals and things like that which uh, actually became a very significant thing uh, later when I left the Tasmanian Institute of Sport and uh, I was offered a job out of the blue to go to um, Essendon Football Club, an mm. AFL club in uh, Melbourne and uh, that was the end of 1998. It was a bit of a crossroads in my life and I thought I was probably leaving athletics for the first time. It was a big thing to do, to leave my track program and, and go to Melbourne but that's what I did. So well, I was gonna, Yeah, I was going to say, John, like they obviously identified, you know, your whole career was in athletics and they sort of and and i feel like we you know i follow afl as as well and i feel like they went through a period where they're like hey we need to you know train these well, um, it was a big, ath- like you know like athletes gamble. it was a yeah. big gamble and uh kevin sheedy was the driver of that gamble he was the coach of the bombers mm. and he wanted someone to teach him how to run and i think the beauty and i look on it now i'd never seen a game of afl i literally I didn't really even know how to spell AFL, and I find myself at this club. Bru- Brucey still can't. That's gold. <laughs> That's gold. Yeah, Brucey still can't. Flip that up. That's my okay. God. I found myself at this massive club with this huge history, and we used to, um, you know, there'd be breaks in the day, and uh, uh, this club was at Windy Hill in Essendon, and they had a, a museum or a hall of fame, and every chance I'd get, I'd disappear off to this hall of fame i didn't even know who the players were when i arrived i didn't know the superstars so they weren't superstars to me they were just Mm. guys that played football and i'd go off to the hall of fame so uh, the captain of the club was a guy called james hurd who won a brownlow medal which is a you know huge award in in afl but i'd go off and read about say dick reynolds who was a superstar of the past well dick reynolds became as real to me as james hurd and I'd, i'd learned all about essendon's history uh, to the point where it just merged into the present. And mm. I think that was probably a good thing. But um, I remember getting to Essendon and uh, a guy who became uh, one of my closest friends, he was the doctor of the club and rest his soul, he passed away a couple of years ago, Bruce Reed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the best Such people a, you yeah. would have ever had the privilege to meet and work with and I was one of those. And uh, anyway, Reedy just said to me, look, we've got a guy here, he's had an injury to his foot He's done it twice and um, there's not much we can do. We've just got to get him through this year and pretty much that's the end for him. But he'll he'll come and chew your ear off. Yeah. I said, oh, okay. So I went down into my office and I literally, my bum had just hit the chair and there's a knock on the door. And this guy comes and he goes, oh, I'm James Hurd. And I said, oh, nice to meet you, Hurdy. I'm John. Da, da, da. He says, do you know anything about navicular stress fractures? And with the doctor's words ringing in my ear, I said, actually, yes, I do. <laughs> Um, that's a track and field injury. It's a small bone in your foot. He said, yeah, I've um, had two uh, stress fractures in my foot. Do you reckon you'd know how to get that sorted? Oh, I'd be pretty confident we could. So uh, off we went on this uh, uh, project to get his foot done and everything was going brilliantly well uh, until one of the early games of the season in 1999 and uh, he cracked the bone in his navicular for the third time. And... I actually, I'm sure though someone has, but I've never heard of anyone that's come back from three naviculars. But I went home from the MCG that night after the Carlton game and I knew that I was responsible for breaking down one of the superstars of the game and I promised him that I'd get him back and had let him down and I literally couldn't sleep. And somewhere out of the recesses of my mind, I remembered I was in a place called Rader in Germany and I'd gone off to meet all these other specialist doctors and things. And I'd found this doctor there that was specialising in a form of uh, stimulant that could stimulate the bone to grow. And it was a days of dial-up. So it was about 3.30 in the morning and I rang this number in Germany and Muller answered. Hmm. Oh, yes, I remember you. You are the Australian man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had to get Therapeutics Goods Act approval and and all sorts of 
um, protocols had to be passed off, had to find a surgeon who was Julian Feller, one of the great surgeons in the country in Melbourne, and uh, uh, they operated on Herd's foot, injected osteoprotein 1, OP1, into the bone, and um, he never had a sore foot from that day forward. We did all the rehab in water and all these other weird and wonderful things, and Herd was the captain of Essendon, uh, in 2000 and Essen went through we lost one game in 2000 and Heard held the trophy aloft in my office at home I've got Herdy's um, jumper from 2000 signed and the medal from 2000 it's not about the football it's about that yeah, and, that's, and that's like who knows about that that's epic I, I hadn't heard that anyway but that's, that's amazing that's oh, amazing that, it, that must have been so satisfying it is even now that. and it's yeah. a quarter of a century ago <laughs> it is and you know it was probably against the odds, but it was a great one. And look, I've got a, a very special relationship with, with Herdy. I'd like to think I've got a special relationship with uh, a lot of players that I've worked with, but that was a really special one. And, uh, and to be part of that premiership, Essendon will always be a very special place for me. It was a, a great place that I had the honour to be a part of, or just a little part of their history. And that 2000... Um, premiership. I mean, I can still remember that, but I couldn't hang around very long for the celebrations because when I moved to Essendon, I thought I was probably finished with athletics, but I had a couple of athletes ask me would I coach them, and I did, and they were very good athletes and great people. I'm coaching Lauren Hewitt and Lee Naylor, and they both made the Olympic team for 2000, and then I was named as a team coach for 2000 to look after the 400. There's more stories in that, but this oh, podcast doesn't go long enough. <laughs> we, want the, we, want, yeah, we want the 2000, no, so I, the Cathy um, Freeman to, stuff. Well, I had to um, leave the celebrations for Essendon and jump on the plane to get to Sydney for the opening ceremony of the Olympics. So uh, I, don't, I hope this doesn't come across in a boasting way, but I was involved in the um, pre-grand final procession uh, with the Essendon players and uh, and then the whole buzz of the MCG with over 100,000 fans and then winning the thing, it's just amazing. But then to come up to Sydney and be involved in the opening ceremony for Australia at our Olympic Games and to go into that stadium, that wasn't lost on me then and the privilege and honour of doing it's not lost on me. Even now, I can still feel it. So... Yeah, the Olympics was a very, very special time. And my role there was I had uh, Lauren and Lee competing and um, and also I was a team coach. So I had the privilege of... Um, I wasn't Cathy Freeman's personal coach. That was Peter Fortune. Um, and uh, But I was the team coach. And there wouldn't be too many Australians that... Um, would not know of Kathy Freeman and her success, and a lot of it's one of those "where were you when" mm. times. That's well, for me, that moment in Australian history, I think I was a shadow. I was a shadow of that moment in time because it was. I had to go and be at the warm-up track when Kathy was getting ready for the final say, and the, I'm watching the clock and seeing to fort. Okay, mate, you got five minutes three minutes okay we've got to go so we're that walking. was you yeah so i'm saying <laughs> let's go so i'm walking with the kathy. whole country brucey i'm walking over to the main stadium with kathy and we're walking and um is she is she in the suit at this time no i didn't no. know anything about the suit no okay. one did and uh we're walking across and we're just making small talk and kathy's saying to me um oh yeah it's a great night for running and oh, you can actually feel the energy of the crowd even from here. You know, it was just, it was almost like we were just going to a, a normal everyday meet and everything was good and I was, well, I felt like I was pretty calm about the whole thing. I got her as far as I could and I just said, well, Kath, that's as far as we can go. So, look, you have a great run, all the very best. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, my God, the whole Olympics is riding on your little shoulders here. But off you go. And I watched her walk down the race, watched her get, you know, checked in and everything so that was all good my job was pretty much done and I had my accreditation uh, the thing around your neck and I went up I had my great seats best seats in the place and I nestled in to watch and that's when I saw the hood coming up over I didn't know anything about that but well why would they have to tell me anyway but anyway so she she wins that race and it was the race it's the greatest race 100 percent my experience in sport it was phenomenal and of course I'm the team coach so the first thing I thought when she won that was 
I've got to get down there just to make sure everything's right. So I'm trying to get through the crowd. And I've got an Australian tracksuit on and everyone's high-fiving everyone. But if you had an Australian tracksuit, you have probably got high tens. So I'm try, trying to get past. I've got about halfway. And I thought, why the bloody hell would she want to see you anyway? And I thought, yeah, she wouldn't. I would walk back to the village. So I started walking. It was a beautiful night in Sydney. And it was everyone. It was like New Year's Eve multiplied by 50. And it was such a euphoric time. And I'm walking back to the village and I'm, just enjoying the moment and my phone rang and I looked at it and it says Freeman on the screen and I thought oh shit something's happened and on the coach and I didn't go down there I'm going to be the failure you know something's happened and you were meant to be there so I've answered with a bit of trepidation said hi Kath and she goes hi Quinny oh congratulations on a great run understatement of the century and you know congratulations on a great run she said oh just so relieved it's over but yeah it was great and it's this and I said well Kath why exactly are you ringing me and she goes oh I was doing my warm down and I couldn't remember if you said relay training tomorrow was at 9 30 or 10 Oh. I said, look, tonight you're the queen of the world. You can, you can forget relay training. You don't have to be there. It's at 9.30, but just have the day. Enjoy the night. It's a special one for you. And she said, oh, okay, thank you. Congratulate, da 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 you know, I got to the track the next morning at quarter past nine to make sure we were all set up for our relay because we wanted to have a really good crack for the women's 4 by 4 And they actually ran the Australian record, which still stands Who, who were the four runners? Oh, oh gosh. Had in there. No, no. Yeah. Um, we had uh, Lee Naylor, Yana Pittman, um, oh, yeah. uh, Tamsin Lewis, oh, yeah. uh, Kathy Freeman. They weren't friends. And Nova Perris. Really. They were all part of yeah. it. Oh, yeah. A lot of that was media hype. I mean, they. they so that's a good. Yeah, that's yes, correct yeah. memory. I do remember Tamsin and Yana butted heads a bit from yeah. memory. Yeah, well, I worked with Yana Pittman for a while too. I mean, they're, they're just such driven individuals she I was mean, just she was just on the uh the amazing race with her son they did yes, really well on, yeah 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 they, they cool, cool. how how impressive was he oh yes that yeah, kid. well she's uh an impressive impressive yeah, individual, yeah. Yana. i mean uh, to achieve her high levels that she did and in, uh international track but she's now a doctor and she won't be satisfied with that she'll go and she'll be a surgeon or something <laughs> she's a she's a high achiever but no i i i, I often t- um talk to people about understand your responsibilities and when i think of the kathy freeman you know she's just thinking about what she had to do the next day for that relay and that was her she could have done anything but her job was that focus on your task and what you have to do she's a superstar and that expresses itself yes in a gold medal but she's far more than what that gold medal suggests can you tell us in what in your mind what makes what made Kathy so special and, and to be able to to be able to withstand the whole country the, the, the amount of pressure that she was on like I, I remember it pretty vividly and I was in Sydney in 2000 as well I wasn't there on the night I was in Bondi though mm. and um, yeah I just remember the whole entire country the amount of pressure that she had because she was she had the world did she have the world record or she was the fastest run she was she the favourite she just gone up against uh, in the world championships before a girl called Perek and uh uh, there was a big rivalry between them. That's and, right. And the suggestion was that Prick was going to uh, to get her, and you know it would all. But it was a fairy tale. For and because she lit the thing, she well, took that the, was the another thing. The pressure, yeah, the pressure. Do you she took the, that. The yeah, thing yeah. Pop, it jammed. Oh, that's right. Yeah, no, that's right. And no, no, no. Well, mm-hmm. So that sums Kathy up. Like she just is in the moment. Yeah. And uh, does what she needs to do, and I think she is very confident in her own ability. She knows who she is. She knew what she was capable of. She had great people around her. And, uh, and they just made the, the whole process one that allowed her to achieve at the highest level. But was there something that you think that, that separated her? Because a lot, most athletes at that high level are probably ticking those boxes. Was there something that sets Kathy apart? Because, yeah, like you said, that's probably the one of the, if not the greatest race ever run, definitely by an Australian and uh, one of the greatest Australian sporting events up there with America's Cup. And- I think she kept it in context for what it was. It was a race, and she just had to stick to her plan of what she had to do. She knew she'd done the work, and so she was- knew that she was ready for that race on that night, and she had people around her that were um, 
supportive of her for not just it wasn't just that night it was for many years before that I mean she was an outstanding junior athlete as well um, the frightening part actually the saddest part for Australia is I believe we've got Kathy Freemans yeah. and Tommy Freemans if you like all over this country that don't know how good they are or how good they can be and it's when things align that you can bring those people out I mean I'm quite confident that we've got in the western suburbs of sydney here probably as i'm talking to you walking around at westfield probably with a knife in their pants <laughs> we've got a, a, a potential olympic athlete that more likely is going to go into juvenile justice i i've spent time uh, going to visit kids in juvenile justice centers here our best athletes are in jail and we've got to get them out we've got to be creating more opportunities we've got a problem in this country right now with rising uh, youth crime well, we've got to create opportunities and give them hope and opportunity, not fear and limitation. And that's uh, a sport is a great vehicle for that. And that's, that's, well, I've been doing it, but I'm going to be bloody doing it a lot more in the 12 months ahead. We've got to get the opportunity program up and going. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? Because we've, we've got young kids ourselves and, you know, once you become a parent, you start to look at the avenues and think, I've got to get them into sport, keep them in sport. If they're in sport, you know, their heads are cooking. They're, they're not the hanging down the shopping centre. They're not down the Westfield, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, to yeah, for us to be parents, that's 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 the stuff you want to hear. Well, you, look, it is that. and it's. But the, the, the sad thing is, you know, we've still got a divide in this country between our Indigenous population, and it's not good enough. We've got to bring... There is no colour here. We're one, mm. and we should be one. And now we're bringing immigrants into this country who haven't understood the culture and they're trying to fit in, but then they're bringing their own culture here. I understand that. But we've got to embrace African Australia as well in this country and make them part of who we are. This is the most blessed country on the planet and we're all privileged to be part of it. And we've got to get us all on the same level and create the same opportunities. You can't go to a young guy, I'll, I'll use Sydney because we're here, but you can't go to the western suburbs of Sydney and say, look, mate, come on, you're super talented. Let's get you into the sport and come in. And they turn up to the track if they can avoid, uh, uh, afford the, the train to get there. And when they arrive, they've got to pay $6 to get in. And then it's 150 bucks for the shoes. And it's a, mm. you know, a membership. And then it's this and then it's that. They can't afford it and it's not realistic. So we've got to create programs to facilitate that and let's give people that it's much cheaper way to facilitate excellence than to pay for the bloody mess and mm. the mayhem that is left behind and what the cost of having them go into detention that's, yeah 100 that's the, the challenge the barrier to entry is just a little bit too great isn't it yes you know we talk about how great it will be to get to the olympic games and i love the olympics i, I, I always have I've, I've loved the olympics since i was a little boy but um it's more important to succeed at Olympics of life and uh, get these people uh, going further, higher, faster in life, not just on a track. Mm. Yeah, John, it sounds like, and back to that mental, spiritual, physical part of it, I think just hearing that and hearing the, the depths that you go to in coaching, I guess, I, I suppose is super interesting i was never good enough at sport to have a coach such as yourself but <laughs> well maybe you chose the wrong sport well that's you know, that, exactly that, what happened yeah. of course it was <laughs> like that. let's just go with that and move on. <laughs> yeah correct <laughs> um but that's that's super super interesting because once you get to those higher heights you assume that there's some real stuff real proper i guess stuff going on at that level mm. so to hear you talking about you know the depths you go going back to their families and where they're from and their childhoods and mm. digging deep you know the you know the psychology of it sounds sounds where that sounds where the potentially the magic lies well it is uh, and it, it's universal as well um after i left yes and i couldn't imagine actually working in any other afl club it was such a unique uh, special experience for me and uh so when i left the bombers after 10 years i set up my own business in melbourne doing clinical work. I was, I'd by now done another degree 
and I'd done a master's in, I actually chose to do an occupational health and safety because I thought the only thing that's really certain about being a coach is one day you're going to be sacked. So I needed to get to pick an industry that I could go into and everyone has to have oh and So I did mine in uh, oh and but all my uh, examples of uh, uh, occupation with sport so my thesis was on hydration in AFL and how it impacts performance and injury so anyway I found myself um, doing all sorts of things I went to India uh, with part of the now defunct Indian Cricket League I never really liked cricket much but I got to enjoy that I was with Bangladesh and we traveled around and I loved it and loved the exposure to a different culture and uh, being in India um, as a real foreigner the first time I really felt like a foreigner. It was uh, a great experience for me. Um, I did lots of other different different things as well in there. And then out of the blue, I got uh, a phone call from the AFL. I did some work also with the um, international rules, so the Gaelic footy, so I oh, went yeah. to Ireland. And that's when I was talking to, uh, he was the boss of the AFL at the time, Andrew Dimitriou. And he got talking to me and he didn't realise my background of how I'd come from country New South Wales and blah, blah, blah. And he, in his mind, he's thinking, we can get you as part of this new team in Western Sydney. I didn't know that it was going to have a, an uh, AFL thing, you know, uh, with Essendon all there. So anyway, I decided I'll go back to Sydney. That's where I'm from. We're shady. I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So they've got yeah. back to the old got bands, yeah, got, got back, back together. together mate. So yeah. we got here and uh, set the club up. And so that was a unique thing to be able to set up a club in Western Sydney. Remember, Elite I started, talent, all the best talent in, you yeah, know, they well, got well, all the I started the working for Little Athletics, which were based in Parramatta, where pretty much where we were. So look, it was, uh, yeah, all nostalgic and everything seemed great. It was good timing for my two kids to be able to go, to go to school up here in Sydney. So all of that was going really well and... Uh, Oh, then I guess the shit hit the fan, really. I, I went through a marriage breakdown and I've always been a fairly resilient character and uh, I learnt my biggest lessons. I, I developed an autoimmune disease called limbic encephalitis and uh, it's literally where your brain is on fire. And I've lost about 10 years of memory. I don't remember a lot of my time actually with the Giants. I remember coming here I, and I remember the first house we lived in I don't remember my wife of the time saying that she was leaving, um, but I know it's true because I took a diary and, and everything else. But the chances of surviving encephalitis are less than 10%. Um, they can't stop the inflammation on your brain. And it's almost like if you can imagine having lightning strikes going in your brain, you don't know where lightning's going to hit the ground. And so where the lightning strike in your brain goes off, so to speak, it damages that part of your brain. So for me, I've lost um, a lot of sense of smell. Uh, the food doesn't taste like it used to. I've lost memory. I've lost vision in my eye. Uh, I became quite emotional. Um, and I've lost at least seven years of memory like it never happened. So um, it's quite confronting when I think back to... I woke up in the house one day. I knew it was my house because the furniture was mine, but... The door was in a different place and the dresser was different. And then I heard my son and so I got up and I called him and he walked out of the room and my nine-year-old, um, he was about 17. And uh, even now I find that pretty confronting. And that time had just slipped past me and I might have been there, but I don't remember it. I was in hospital for over a year um, 18 months actually and then I spent another year in care and my sister took took care of me down in Canberra and then um, I wanted to get back to Sydney I don't remember coming back to Sydney but my objective was to get back to my kids mm. and uh, um, I needed to be there to be their dad and so I got back here and uh, the Giants created a job for me and uh, I went to work at the Giants but I knew I had to work on me and I've always had this great affinity with Japan. There's something about Japan. I took leadership tours there with Essendon back in the day. They've still got Yakult as their sponsor on the footy, if you look. That was from <laughs> one of those trips. Um, but uh, I remember being with my sister, and we went to the specialist in Canberra. And um, Rosemary said, oh, would you just tell him what you're thinking to do? And I said, well, is it going to be all right if I travel? And the doctor goes, oh, 
yeah, travel should be okay. Where are you thinking of going? I said, well, I'm actually thinking of going to Japan. Oh, Japan? Oh, it's a fair way. Mm, well, what happens if you get lost? I said, well, how can you get lost if you don't know where you are in the first place? <laughs> and he said, well, I can't argue with that. And he said, when are you thinking of going? I said, oh, I'm flying out in the morning at 7.30. He said, so you're not actually asking me, you're telling me. I said, sort of. So the next morning I flew to Tokyo and I got on the bullet train and I went to Nagano. And I went up into the mountains of Nagano and I was literally up above the world and all there was cloud below and there were a couple of pine trees around but I could see snow-capped mountains and it was just me. That's the loneliest I've ever been in my existence. And I had to face reality of where I was and where I'd been and I had to make a decision of where I was going to go to. And all that coaching and all those things I'd talked to athletes about for many years suddenly had a whole new meaning and a whole new purpose. And when you talk about mental, physical, spiritual, it's got a whole new meaning when you're on top of the world and looking at your very own existence and what the future holds for you. And I was, yeah, I was in a world of pain on that mountain. But I decided it was time to stand up and step forward and take the world on. And I was on top of that mountain and I made a, a decision. One of the decisions I made was the Olympic Games were going to come to Tokyo in the future. And I wanted to be at those Olympics. I wanted to coach an athlete onto those Games. So I came down off the mountain. I needed to lose weight. So I lost because I, I could only taste um, three foods, white chocolate, vanilla ice cream, and Coke. When I was in the hospital... There's not a bad couple well, in there. They're just quite... Well, <laughs> craving sugar. Yeah. And I'm in the hospital, and I thought the nurses were waitresses on a cruise ship. And I thought other patients in the hospital beds were on deck chairs. It's amazing how the brain copes. I didn't recognise my own kids while I was in hospital. And uh, oh, I was having a wonderful time. And so I kept ordering from the waitresses white chocolate, vanilla ice cream and Coke, which they brought because it's got around about a 90% um, chance you won't survive it. And um, so everyone, because you, you develop from the seizures you've had, um, you develop inoperable brain tumours. So I had a 90% chance I'd be checking out pretty soon. And if you didn't check out, if you're in the la that last 10%, well, 80% of those, so 8% of those, you're um, going to be in an institution for the rest of the time and just have to be cared for. And then if you're in the lucky 2%, then 1% of those, you're going to need ongoing care and assistance. And if you're in the very, very lucky 1%, you're talking to me. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget the privilege I have. And I'd like to say it's my fortitude and my mental toughness and stuff but it's just the luck of the draw I think but I get to help other people that have got encephalitis or a loved one with encephalitis there's always hope and you've got to hang on to that but having a taste for all those foods I put on 20 kilos now I had a fair few steroids in me too to uh, try to get the inflammation off my brain but uh, yeah so I um um uh, need to get their weight off so I, that was number one goal I had a number of goals I won't go into it here but the one what stop looking like jab of the hut and get yourself in some sort of shape get back into coaching and get yourself to the Olympics well you know when everybody was talking about the Olympics in Tokyo I had the greatest honour of anyone in this country to be named as a team coach for Tokyo Olympics. Let's fucking oh, go! We had. <laughs> yeah. Even now it makes me emotional. Oh, congratulations. I don't try to hide it. Yeah, no, yeah. it's epic, man. It was um, such a special thing to be part of the Australian team for the Olympics and it meant so much more than just being at a sporting event. For me, it put a closure on the shittest time of my life mm -hmm. and it was the launch pad for the future which keeps the promise of bigger and better things to come. So from there, burning the boats, of course. Burning the boats. What was the what was the impetus of that decision when you were on top of that mountain 
that you were going to go to Tokyo? Do you, do you remember what, what got you there? Well, one of the highlights and honours of my life was being part of the Sydney Olympic Games. And as I said earlier, I've had this affinity of with Japan. I've been there a number of times. I've learnt to speak a little bit of Japanese, um, shockingly, but I could still get by. And I'm in, in the heart of Japan and just on the mountain, it just seemed to make sense that that was I needed an end point. So I'm starting now, and by this time, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be coaching this person or these people. I'm going to do this, do this. I will have achieved it by then. Give yourself measurable outcomes. There's no cop-outs. So mine was, even if I just had an athlete, I was talking about I want to coach an athlete on it, on the team, and I would go to watch them. That was what I wanted to do. <laughs> and, just, and it was around the it show. Was <laughs> oh no! So you know, I talk. Yeah, I love amazing. Olympic memorabilia. So at home, I've got a, a top. Um, it was a competition top from Bendiria Boyer, who's a 400 meter runner at those games that I was coaching, and my accreditation. Again, it's not just an Olympic top. It's far more than that. It's a spiritual meaning of it. It is. It's, yeah, it's deep. Absolutely. It's very. It's a. It's a, a milestone in life. That's what it is. Hmm. And, a, and a very big one an emotional one for it you was. John that was an amazing story yeah. um, you know to get to the heights where you were you talked about Kathy Freeman and you being the team coach and all that sort of thing and then it sounds like you you know you really got to ground zero there it was ground um, zero ground zero ironically was on top zero. of the world <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I, so I call it that yeah. and uh, yeah so I was up there and uh, that was my ground zero and it was a, a really challenging time for me on many levels, but um, again, great support from different organisations, from uh, uh, the AFL. The Giants, and, and, yeah, and the, the Giants, Giants, yeah, Sheedy. Yeah, and well, Gubby Allen was a massive oh, okay. support. Yeah, Gubby, yeah, yeah, Gubby, yeah. Gubby's one of the special people of uh, sport yeah. in this country and he's been involved with some very successful organisations. Not a coincidence. I mean, you talk about people like Kevin Sheedy and Gubby Allen. It's not just coincidence that where they go, success isn't far away. Yeah, there's, right. there's something unique about those people. But the AFL, even from uh, Andrew Dimitri, who was the boss, they were all very supportive of me. David Matthews, who's the CEO of the Giants Footy Club, everyone swung in. Everyone needs support at some time in your life, in their life. You've just got to be able to look out for those people and catch them when they fall. And everyone's going to have that crossroads time. How, have you got the tools to move through it? I, I think as a coach, that helped me. I, I had a pretty... Good yeah, you had kit. some tool. You had your triad yeah, to go back to, right? Yeah, that, that triad. So it's it sounds like the first time you had to really look in the mirror, absolutely, and you had to get spiritual and figure out. Well, you because the thing is, people don't like. You can think about it, and you think you've got the answer, but it's not until you're in that position and you realise you don't have the answer, and you really need to ask yourself and 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 be vulnerable. And do you know what I mean? Like yeah, you, I do. you yeah. have to really go deep and. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard for me but, to explain, but I but think... But until you go through that, you're really just a person of words. You're not really much substance. Mm. And as I've got older, I've realised everybody has got their challenge coming. If you haven't had it, yeah. get ready and just prepare yourself. Be the best you can be uh, because it's coming for you. Yeah, when, I, when I was younger, my mum used to say, because you know, we had some things happen when I was younger, my mum used to say, it's not just us. As you grow older you'll begin to understand that every everyone has their own issues and everyone's issues are different. Because I used to say, why us? Like, what, what have, you know what I mean? Mm. But yeah, and, and as of, mum used to say that a lot, and then as now I've grown older, it's proven to be very true. So yeah, it's crazy. No, no, I think um, it, it rounds, it's rounded me off as a person. I think I'm much more empathetic now to, uh, people with um, mental health issues, brain injuries. And like for me personally, I feel like, I hope this isn't too dramatic, but I feel like I've, I've sat in the lounge room of dementia and I've walked the hallways of Alzheimer's. And thank God I found the front door. You know? but, but I can, what are the chances? Yeah. I get it because a lot of people can't find the yeah, front door. Yeah, yeah, and, and I can say to someone whose who's, um, mum or dad say, I've got dementia, I can talk to them with some form of not authority but just say just love them for who they are and they, they might not recognize you but they're happy with the place they're at mm -hmm. and you just be you and enjoy the fact that you've got them in your life now don't write them off that they're 
gone or that they're dead. They are the person that they are is still there. Be with them. I, I was in their place. I found the front door. Mm. Amazing, amazing stuff, John. And yeah, what you've gone through and, and, you know, missing that block of time and all that sort of stuff, it's, it's you know, it's really heavy stuff. So, and, and, and make sort of credit to you, the bloke that sits here today that we had a mix up today and, you know, and then you end up coming across town 40 minutes and we're doing a podcast at nine o'clock at night. Like, I saw, I see a bloke and you're on, who's a pl- on a plane tomorrow morning. On a plane too. tomorrow to Melbourne. Um, you're up with the Giants at 6 a.m. this morning. So, See a guy that sort of made a bit of a deal with yourself that that you sort of you're not going to uh, you're not going to shy away from much. That's what it feels like, like anyway. Well, you know, I said to you earlier, I've never worked a day in my life like is this work. You're coming in, <laughs> and I'm talking about the subject I probably know most about. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know what the funniest yeah. part was when you came and you go, so so who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. got up. Oh, I'm just Ben, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, that was brilliant. No, that's all okay. But I think. Uh, yeah, the, you know, there's exciting things coming and you just get on with that. I've I've been enjoying uh, work with the Giants and I've been there now for, well, since their inception. I've spent the last couple of years working with uh, Penrith Panthers in the Rugby League and I just did speed agility there. And um, I'm not there this year. Um, I've just, you know, um, well, you heard me before on that uh, call. I'm doing a couple of days' work, doing some lecturing at the University of Technology around... Um, uh, practicum students and, and sports science, exercise science. So I'm quite active in that that space. But um, it's been great to work. In, it was surreal also, going from AFL, I'd be in the inner sanctum talking about uh, player selection, and then I'd leave to get in the car to go out to Penrith and walk into there and be talking with the coaching staff or the players about the game coming this weekend, the two big codes in Australia to be able to do that, and then come back that afternoon to work with my athletes on the track, getting mm. ready for a major meet. It's a surreal... It, mm. This isn't work. Mm-hmm. This is just... What, what, Sounds pretty what amazing. John, not, I've got one that we... Uh, when we had a bit of a chat before we started today and you mm. shared a story about a, uh, an Afghanistan young girl named uh, Kimia. Kimia, you Sophie. Yeah, so you can make... Can you share that story with our audience? Because it's a... Yeah, it's a pretty cool story. Oh. Especially leading into the Olympics this year, which yes. is... Yeah, it makes it even more special. Well, the the thing it's amazing you know you you can be walking past people and uh, Kimia was at the uh, Tokyo Games as well and she was representing Afghanistan in fact she was the flag bearer for Afghanistan and I've got this iconic photo I think it is of her and she's in Afghan clothes and she's got the Afghan flag and behind her is the team it's all men in the photo and uh, whilst they had gone to uh, Tokyo for the Olympics the Taliban had invaded Afghanistan and had put in extreme law. And Kimia, they used her image across state media in Afghanistan and basically said, this is what an enemy of the state looks like and we'll show you what happens to an enemy of the state on her return. When we think about organisations like the International Olympic Committee and even the, our own Australian Olympic Committee, a lot of people... Look, focus on the largesse and, you know, the dinners and the functions and the high life and, you know, I've never seen the Olympics really for that. I know that there, there is an element of that. But the International Olympic Committee became aware and when Kimi had finished competing in Tokyo, she literally vanished and no one knew where she went. And it wasn't long after her mother and brother who were in Afghanistan, they just disappeared and no one knew where they went. And here in Australia, we wouldn't be any the wiser. I certainly wasn't. Mm. And I had a phone call um, oh, it was over a year after the Olympics in Tokyo and it was from Geneva and it was a, uh, they had a meeting of the International Olympic Committee Federations there and Kimi was supposed to be going to another country to be resettled, repatriated and something had happened that hadn't been organised properly and there was a delegate from the Australian Olympic Committee and I I reckon she probably said, look, we've got this nutcase in Sydney that looks after refugee athletes, he'd probably look after them. (laughs) And uh, the chair said, well, we don't care if she goes to this country, she ends up in Sydney, but we need to get something done. So hence I got a phone call from Geneva, would you look after this athlete from Afghanistan? Of course. So about a week, 10 days later, this young 
just the shyest girl turns up. She can't speak one word of English. Um, well, she could probably speak a few words. She could speak a few more than I could speak a Farsi. And uh, so we're trying to communicate with sign language. And I've found this app through Google. So I'd speak to her in English. It would translate to Farsi. And that's how our coaching relationship started. But uh, uh, the what had happened is the International Olympic Committee had got her out of the village and put her in hiding and then brought her mother and brother with her and put her in hiding. And she was in Iran ironically right under the nose of the Taliban and uh, then they've got her out she's come to Australia the, um, the AOC the Australian government have helped settle her and her family here her other brothers have now come into Australia too and they've developed lives for themselves she's one of the most committed athletes that um, I've worked with she's not the most talented athlete I've ever coached or anything like that but if your heart and commitment and desire stands for anything this is one of the most satisfying athletes I've ever worked with. And so now she's getting ready to go to Paris for the Olympic Games. Ironically, with the way the world works, she may well represent Afghanistan at those Olympic Games, but she won't go back to Afghanistan. She'll come back to Australia. And if she doesn't, she'll represent for the uh, refugee team. But uh, she's one of the most uh, resolute, strong, focused individuals i've ever worked with and i find it very inspiring i think uh john and you you touched on that earlier when we're out the back but um you know even you know talk to us about what you know the way she explains her role you know she explains her you know you said that young setting goals i I took her i took her into a, a private school here in sydney i do some work at the scots college here in sydney and uh uh, they have a program that they have for students there uh, around refugees coming to this country to educate the young boys at that school of the challenges that other people that don't have such a privileged life as we do in Australia. And so I've taken a, another couple of athletes in there as well. But this day they asked would I be able to bring Kimia in. And it wasn't really till I was there I realised how probably thoughtless I was, that here's this diminutive young lady in her Afghan clothes in front of an auditorium packed with young men and predominantly male staff. And I thought, bloody hell, how dumb are (laughs) you? And she just took everything in her stride. And we had a presentation that we'd organised together and it had... I've got some fantastic uh, photos of Kimia and her training and so on. And it was all up there. And uh, she, 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 by now she's speaking pretty good English and she spoke very well. And then it came time for questions. And one question came from a boy in year nine and he just simply said, how did you achieve what you had? Was it about goals? Did you set goals for yourself? And I just assumed she'd give the standard answer of goal setting. And she said something along the lines of, when I was a young girl about your age, I had a dream. And I had a dream of going to the Olympics and what it would take for me to be there. And I found a coach and he told me that I had to make my dreams a goal so that it was something more realistic. And so we worked on goals and to get to the Olympics. And she went to Rio and then, of course, she goes to Tokyo. And she said, but now with all the things I've learned through life and what life has taught me and how hard things have been, I've come here to Australia and I've had to rebuild my life and my family have had to rebuild my life. It's actually not about dreams and it's not about goals. I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to other girls in Afghanistan to show them that it is not right that you are held back. I have a responsibility to women all around the world to say... We are equal and we should be treated as such. I have a responsibility to all of humanity to say we are one and we are equal. For me, it's very important that I don't have dreams, I don't have goals. What I have is responsibility. My name is Kimia. That's wild. Yeah, that's powerful, isn't it? What sort of impact did that have on on the... The, the bunch of, um, of, of schools, yeah. It was silent <laughs> for 15 to 20. 
because you could hear, and even now I get emotional thinking of it, but um, it was palpable and very powerful. I've been involved in a lot of talks and presentations, but I wasn't expecting that. Um, I wasn't expecting that. I thought we were just going to the school to give a, a little pep talk to some kids about you know, refugees in this country and the opportunities Australia gives, and isn't Australia a great country? But it was much more than that. It was a life lesson for me. Mm. Incredible. John, amazing story. This has been an amazing chat. Crazy, and we really appreciate you going oh, so deep no and worries. so raw. Um, we could probably sit here for another hour and keep talking. To I'm running talking. through all the I thought you wanted me to tell you some stories. I've got all these stories to tell you. Yeah, well, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? What's your best one, John? What's your best one? Because you would. You'd have a lot. From the hall. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. It's, um, it's been uh, a great experience, and you know, I've been really lucky to have been able to be involved with a number of different sports at, um, at the highest level. And, uh, you know, from a, a kid from a country town that just played a bit of a rugby league and uh, had a dream of uh, coaching athletics, you know, it's uh, taken me all around the world and then some. Mm. And uh, I haven't run my race yet. <laughs> Still just, plenty to go. Just getting warmed up. Yeah, it's, yeah, so. yeah, man, it's a blessing for us as well to be able to talk to someone because we get to talk to, you know, a lot of the, the, the athletes and, and entertainers and entrepreneurs on the front line. But to talk to someone that's, you know, genuinely a legend that's, you know, been part of some really big Australian sporting moments and to, to, to captain an Australian team of any type you know, or be a coach, mm. um, yeah, he's epic. And, to, yeah, for you to, to hear the stories from behind, you know what I mean? Like lifting yeah. it up behind the athlete, it's, it's fascinating. And, and, and John's shaping, you know. Yeah, doing it's, his it's bit fucking to shape, fascinating. To shape see, his yeah. bits of the Australian history. And it's crazy how things. your journey of, like you said, those sliding door moments of, like, you didn't know what football was. Like, you'd, it wasn't like you had a passion for these things. It's just the... Yeah, it's like it was like your path. Just yeah, you just don't know where things are going. Go, yeah. Look, I I went to India with the cricket. Um, the truth was, I never liked cricket. Me and, either. And I went there. Well, I went there because they promised us all this money. So <laughs> I went for the two rhyming words, you know, ching and ching. <laughs> and the ironic part was that we never even got paid. We got ripped off blind by them. But uh, what a, it was a, a life-changing experience for me to go to India. And I still talk with the boys from Bangladesh, and that was more than a decade ago. Um, again, it comes back to it's about people and it's about learning about uh, what makes you tick and how can you help others tick a bit more smoothly. And, and I think it's also about life. It's about experiences, right? Because you're sitting here as an older fella at 59. We're a little bit generation below. Me, not so much. But and it sounds like, and, and it, like Pete said before, you've been down at ground zero. You've been, you've walked those halls, like you said mm. before. And yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, I, 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 it sounds like your reflection is that life is about experiences, right? Like you're talking about these experiences that rich your heart, that, that make you emotional now. And does, it, does that make sense? And it's good yeah. for our audience at home because some people like, and I know, you know, especially when you're a bit younger, you're chasing money and stuff and you, and you might fall into a job because you think that that's what you've got to do. You know, you got lucky because someone came up to you at 17 and, and, and you fell into it. But for those ones at home that think that you've just got to fall into, you know, you said you haven't worked a job a, a day in your life. For those at home that maybe you're thinking that you you know you, you're working this job and you don't want to do it there are other ways to fill to to build a career and it's not about money it's about just like you said you go out you create your own luck by by showing up and then people and, and if you show up the best version each time doors start to open pathways start to go and, and you end up having how it's mind-blowing the career that you've had well you've got <laughs> um you know there's all trendy buzzwords now the one i i hear the most now is about being authentic and people are looking for authenticity, well, stuff all the fancy stuff. Just be yourself. Yeah. That's what authentic really is. Uh, one of my favourite gigs that I've been doing now, this is my, I think, eighth year. I go to Scots College um, one day a week and I mentor the Year 12 boys. And it's just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I've, I've never been part of the school. I'm not an old boy or anything like that. And I don't know or haven't known people that have gone there. So there's no links like that. And so to talk with a young man, 17-ish, who was just uh, about to take off in life away from school and 
and whatever. And we can talk about their inability to get organised just to study and what the planning might be like. And we can talk about preparing for an exam and the stress of not passing, what that might have. But over the course of a year, we might start talking about their own limitations, about issues that might be going on at home. And we might be going to lose the family farm. And I don't know if mum's going to be there when I get back. And my nan has just passed away. And I think the girl might be pregnant. And I don't know who I'm going to tell mum and dad to, I don't want to do that job, but my mum and dad want me to do that. You don't know what's coming. And my job is not to be the oracle, it's to listen and then put them in the direction of where they need to go. And I told you at the very beginning of this, one of the most influential people in my life was a 90-year-old nun who taught me the piano. And she was my mentor, and I'm the mentor to these young guys now. And the ripple effect of that could go on for generations to come long after I'm How born. crazy is that from it's that night? That's life is. That's wild. Yeah, make a difference. Make a difference. And it, it all starts with listening. John, it sounds like you're making an amazing difference and it sounds like you've made a crazy difference over your over your career, but it doesn't sound like you're slowing down. It sounds like you've still got a lot more to achieve and a lot more difference to make. Yeah, well, you, we've, got, we've got another Olympics coming with uh, with an act. So is Kimia, she's on track to... Well, she's on track. I mean, yep. it's a, a different selection process to what we have here in Australia. Uh, she'll be... How, do you, how does that work? She's living here in Australia. She can't go back to Afghanistan. Well, she can't go back to Afghanistan because of the regime that's there, but she can represent Afghanistan. So she'll go to represent Afghanistan. If she's the best athlete, which I understand she is, and we can keep her fit and healthy, um, yeah, she'll go to represent Afghanistan. And you'll, you'll be with her? Well, I, I would be my intention to go there, but uh, that's at the end of the day, like the the I was going to say the athletics, the Olympics gets a bad rap sometimes, like we were saying before, with the large S and everything that goes on. But it's if you get back down to the basic premise of what the Olympics is all about, it's about humanity, and it's about bringing everyone together. Togetherness. And yep. so, Kimi are going to compete in uh, the next Olympic Games in Paris will be all representative of that. And it's important. Exactly. It's important to the Olympics. It's important to Afghanistan. It's important to fe- females. She's, yeah, she's... I, I, I wanted to ask, how old is she? Uh, she's 27. And how old was she when she came to Australia, when they put her in hiding? And 20, oh, she would have been 24, then 25. Yep. Yes. What a story. Yeah. Oh, no, it's a, the life. And I'm sure I don't even know... The, the half of that really you know we have talked about it a little bit but it, it's her own her own private uh, we story. might have to try and get her on the pod john and see if we can uh, unpack be, that story be an interesting <laughs> look she um she's one of the more impressive uh people that i've worked with and i've met a lot of people in my time she's an outstanding individual oh, you've worked with kathy freeman james Hurd. <laughs> just a, <laughs> he's name <laughs> <now. laughs> any I'm, tennis players <laughs> Uh, John, well done. Well done. And thanks again for giving us your time. My pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Amazing chat. All right, guys. Please like, share, subscribe. A dollar going to every... Benjamin? Uh, To every... (laughs) I just thought I'd... You just threw me because you said like, share, subscribe. I just thought I'd stitch you up again, mate. (laughs) Um, Yeah, please, guys. Epidemolis, Belosa, EB. Worst disease you've never heard of. Um, you can go to the littlefishpodcast.com.au. The big pink donut donate button. So yeah. Benny's made it obvious, but it's easy. You know what's free? Subscribing, following, and um, sharing. Yeah. So if you follow, follow, subscribe, share. Lino took the time stamp at the start of the year. We're going to do it. We're going to yeah. We're going to donate a dollar for everyone that does that for the entire year. So, so if you want to send us broke, hit it. <laughs> so, so so get around it and share this to anyone that you think's going to get value. So much gold in that. So much value. See you at the top. You! People want to be part of a winning team. People can find a better version of themselves. If they choose. Hmm. You just need to go start some shit. Action is all that matters. Be a man of your word. I think I look back now and I'm like, whoa, that took some guts. Be kind. Be kind. Be kind. See you at the top. New episode every Wednesday.